was. Yeah. Wouldn't there be a big concentration of of soldiers on the Chinese side to sort of be ready to protect? Yeah, actually, that, that's that's the issue. That's the issue with actually the Chinese army in general. You look at all the defenses. There is like about nine hundred thousand soldiers, but it's uh, everywhere in the country, right? So Sichuan, you need other, quite a lot of people. There you need a lot of people. So actually, there's a, there's a term called Qin Wang, which is when the emperor needs help, you go and help. So there are actually soldiers going over there. But then, but then it's, we, we talk about, you know, uh, actually about 35,000 people died, actually, on the Chinese side. Actually, it's, it's, so the casualties are actually quite high. But so, uh, anyway, when the, when the, when the uh, so Ding took his fleet, the, 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 its injured fleet, into Liu Gongdao, into, back to Wei, Wei Hai. And when that, when it happened, some, something very tragic happened that's got nothing to do with the war, which is in uh, Liu Gongdao, it's an island like this. And then on the other side, uh, it's, a, it's like this, and then it's like this, right? This is just kind of this place. In order to protect um, people from attacking, uh, the, the, the Beiyang fleet actually put mines around this side. And then there was also a sign a plastic sign that, that to show that there are mines here. And then there's also, there's also a sign here that makes sure that you don't touch uh, this, this side where the coral reefs are, uh, like the, 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 the shallow, end, shallow end of the water is. And so when um, Ding Yuan, which is where Ding uh, is, uh, and, and Liu, Liu Butan, a captain, was sailing back in. They were scared of the landmine, so they, so they went closer to this side, to the island, and pushed the sign towards the shallow end of the, um, of the water. And so when the second uh, seven-ton you know, big ship came, they also, again, they're going closer to the island side. And so when that happened, they actually then glided into the shallow end. And so the, um, the captain of, the, of Zheng Yuan, the, the, the other one, a guy called um, Lin Taizhang, Lin, Lin is the uh, same last name as Lin Zexu, so he's actually uh, like uh, it's, uh, his uh, grandnephew. So, uh, so very, very connected. And so Liu um, actually ne never really liked him because it was like, you know, just be like, you know, he thought that, you know, he's, he's the guy who actually rose from the bottom. He studied hard. You are just some guy who is because your great grand, uh, your, your, your grand uncle is so and so, your uncle is so and so, therefore you, got, you get to be the captain of a, of a ship that's the, size, the same size. And so Ding always had a problem with them fighting. So the best way to solve any conflict in the Chinese way, which is probably not the best way, is for their kids to marry each other. So um, Liu's daughter married Lin. And so when Lin, so, so they're kind of, so the in-laws. And so when Lin got into that trouble, he wanted to get some support. Uh, what to do, asked Liu. And Liu just went and Liu offered the same kind of level of support that most in-laws would extend, which is, dude, it's your problem, man. So, so Lin was scared, so scared he committed suicide. So one of the seven-ton ships, the captain committed suicide. And so th this is them in the Weihai. The Japanese were also landing in Weihai. And in Weihai, there were you know, the big cannons, that was, the big forts I was talking about um, that, the, that, the, uh, that the German consultant uh, bought. Uh, there were about 5,000 soldiers, the, the Huai soldiers, uh, on every single one. So each, each, each one of the cannons had about 100. And so when the Japanese took, they just took, it, took the, took the people, uh, cannon one by one by one by one by one by one. So much so that the thing had to get some of his own naval officers to go to, go to, to, destroy, to, to destroy some of the cannons and to fight. But then they all of them died. Now, now uh, to your question, well, how about the... How about the um, how about the army? How about the army that was in Shandong? Now Shandong, the viceroy of Shandong is a guy called Li Binghang, also Li, Li Binghang, but he's on the Wang side. He's always had a problem with Li Hongzhang's power and influence. So he had all the, he had all the soldiers right next door to what's happening. But because he did not, he could, he, he, he did not want to help Li Hongzhang because the Beiyang fleet is Li's property he did not go to the rescue. There, so there was no concept of country whatsoever. I just don't want to help Lee, so I'm not going. So from then on, the, 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 the Japanese fleet came, uh, kept on coming to attack. And this side, the cannons uh, was 
was was was blasting on uh, onto the Beiyang fleet. The Beiyang fleet eventually some sunk and some got took taken over. So, the Beiyang fleet fleet eventually was actually destroyed by Chinese own cannons. And because the Chinese cannons were not were not being rescued, because the other Chinese official uh, would not do it, because they had, he had a problem with, with with the head of the army, and this so so this is how China uh, lost the war. And from here, land, uh, land wars you lost, you know, naval wars you lost. This whole area was in the control of the Japanese, and so that so the um, the the Qing government was thinking, you know, we we don't want they they don't want the same. Forbidden burning of the summer palace again. So you know, like we're going to negotiate, and we negotiate during the war. And this is a great uh, feature of ancient uh, of Chinese dynastic uh, uh, politics. Is whoever is in charge, if they lose, they, he gets blamed, like regardless of the circumstances. So Li Hongzhang, throughout all these uh, uh, military defeats, were actually got uh, his all his power and all his. Um, uh, everything was taken away, and so when when uh, when the negotiations began, the the the, uh, the Chinese had a few um, had two guys um, of same le like of a, a provincial governor level to go to the Japanese. The Japanese would have need none of them, because Li Hongzhang was the guy who was in charge of foreign policy, and so he got so so the so Japanese were like, unless it's Li Hongzhang, we're not going to negotiate. And another thing is, and it's a, it's a very smart thing that the Japanese did, because Li Hongzhang was behind all the modernization period, like, like just like last time. Everything that I talked about was Li Hongzhang, Li Hongzhang, Li Hongzhang, Li Hongzhang. By getting him to go over to Japan to sign this treaty, he becomes the traitor, because he, whoever signs it was, is the guy who would cede land and give capital. And so if, if you undermine Li Hongzhang, you undermine all the whole, the whole modernization period. And that's a great thing vis-a-vis -vis for, for, for the Japanese. And Actually, if anything, history, um, public opinion about Li Hongzhang, it still falls into the same trap that the Japanese have put, has, has put on 120 years ago. So Li Hongzhang had to go. Um, he didn't want to go. His, his, his brother, who was the viceroy of uh, Guangdong Guangxi, was like, let's just go home. We, you, you're 72, I'm 74. You know, it's really not worth it. You know, it's, let's go. Li Hongzhang was like, if I don't go, who's going to go? For, for this country. And so he went with 135 people. One of them is actually, one, one of the people that went was a guy called Wu Tingfang. He was the first barrister of, um, uh, in England, trained in England from China. He, um, he, he went to St. Paul's School in Hong Kong. He, was, uh, that, he, he actually worked at Lincoln's Inn in London, and he came back, he became the first Chinese legislator of Hong Kong. So he was one of the main negotiators. And they went to a place called uh, 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 Shimonake. Shimonake is a, it's a place southern, uh, southwestern um, Japan. Shibosaki, Shibosaki, sorry. And then in that place, that, that's where um, the, the Japanese uh, representative, uh, Ito Hirobuno, bu, bu, uh, Hirohito Hitobumi, who was the uh, prime minister at the time, he, that's where he's from. And so they went to a place, a restaurant called Chun Fan Lou. Um, this is the Chinese Chun Fan Lou. It's famous for um, uh, blowfish, eating blowfish. And so they would go, and then the negotiations would begin. In the beginning, the, the, the Japanese were you know, very courteous. They gave them the best sea view to the, to the Chinese delegates. And so the Chinese delegates would sit, and there was a nice sea view. And then, um, and then uh, Ito would then open the shades, and then what they saw was just the Japanese fleet sailing left and right, left and right, to show the Chinese that, you know, if you don't listen to us, this is going to happen. And so, when, so, so, the gay, so the Japanese was like, okay, we can, we can, um, we, we can stop the fighting, even though we controlled your, your whole uh, your cap the areas around your capital. Uh, he, here's the deal. Um, we want Liaodong Peninsula, all the Daoyu, like including Daoyu Islands, all the islands here, and Taiwan, and 300 million tails of silver. Now, this compared to about 50, uh, about, about uh, 52 years ago, the British wanted um, 14 million tails of silver and Hong Kong Island. So you can compare the scale of what the Japanese are asking versus the, the British. And so the... the, the, the importance of the islands? So this is, this is an interesting part. 
So in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, the, the deal was whatever the Japanese took from China on the basis of unequal treaties must be returned to China. So Taiwan would be a good one. Now the Daoyu Island was interesting. Daoyu Island was actually taken over uh, by the Japanese or they, they, or they, or they took it in uh, January 1895. So it was before the signing of the treaty, of the peace treaty. So technically when the peace treaty was, it's whatever that was ceded to the Japanese, that did not count. So maybe that's just part of Okinawa, right? So, so the, obviously the, the Chinese side was like, no, you, like you took the land um, via a, uh, during the time of war, so that must be returned. The Ch Japanese was like, no, we're just giving back whatever that, uh, that we took uh, with the treaties. So that, that's where the technical detail is. Was it a strategic? Uh, plan? Not, I mean, what not, was the, not really. Why do they want the islands? I mean, what, what's, there's no real natural resources there. Yeah, men's, I think. It's, it's face again. But anyway, the, obviously, they, 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 when, when, the, when, the, when the Chinese um, the side saw the sort of terms, like, there's no way we can give all of this. But then, they, but then they don't want the whole burning of summer passing to happen again. So they try to negotiate, negotiate. Now, the problem is, during the negotiation uh, uh, in the prior year, the Japanese already hacked into the, uh, into the Chinese. Um, Telegraph system. So every single thing that the, the emperor would or would not accept, the Japanese actually knew before Liu Zhang. And then so they were negotiating back and forth, back and forth. And the, after the third time, Liu Zhang left Chun Fan Lou. He was going back to where he was living. Suddenly there was this G, uh, like Japanese jihadist shot Liu Zhang in the left, uh, underneath his left eye, and the bullet went in. It was bleeding, and then and then unfortunately he didn't die. But then. Because of this act of barbarism, of this terrorism, the whole European community, especially they, they, they were actually very fearful that the Japanese have so much influence and power in, in China, it would tip the balance that they were like, okay, like, you know, this is not a, like, this is, a, this is an act of barbarism. The Japanese were very scared. Uh, Ito was like, oh no, like, it, what if the Japanese, what if, what if the Hongzhong would go back to the country, uh, go back to China? We can't, la this war cannot last for us. And so Li Hongzhang was there. Li Hongzhang was like, Let's, let me go back to China. The, Empress, the Emperor Guangxu was like, no, you keep on, you stay there and you ask for better terms. And Li Hongzhang was like, okay. And so the Japanese came back with, they still want exactly the same amount of land, but 20, 200 million tails of silver. And Li Hongzhang was like, okay, if it's one bullet, it's 100 million. How about this? You shot me, you shoot me twice and we get rid of the money. <laughs> All right? And I'm 72 anyway. And so and the Japanese were like, no, we can't. So there was back and forth, back and forth. Again, because the Japanese already knew what the, te the telegraph hacked into the telegraph system, finally the, the um, uh, Liu Zhang signed, at the, obviously at the approval of Guangxu. So that's when the, the, uh, this is the Liaodong Peninsula, the islands, and Taiwan ceded to uh, Japan. Now, when that happened, the Russians were very angry because they were, the, the Russians were very much interested in taking over Korea and the uh, Liaodong Peninsula and North Manchuria. And that, that's why they fought the war 10 years later. And so along with the French, where they have signed the, uh, the dual uh, alliance, and then the Germans also helped as well, that forced Japan to um, cede uh, Liaodong Peninsula back to China, but at the, at the cost of 30 million tails of silver. Now add on to the 1.5 million tales of uh, silver for the, um, for the Japanese troubles of having the armies in Weihai. The total amount of money that the, the, the reparations was 231.5 million, uh, 231 million tales of silver, which comes up to three years of the government revenue of China and four uh, the years of revenue to Japan. That's, the Japanese then took this money and built one of the strongest fleets and armies of the world, he, they, they, like the Japanese were like you know third or fourth uh, uh, in terms of the arms race in around the 1900s. And uh, and it took over Taiwan. What's interesting about Taiwan is when it took over Taiwan, there were a lot of lo the locals were actually they actually fought extremely fiercely. So the Japanese about 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 1,300 uh, soldiers died fighting the main army of China, but 10,000 died when with the local. 
uh, Taiwanese guerrilla warfare against the, against the uh, against the Japanese soldiers, including Emperor Meiji's um, uncle. So this time Taiwan was a part of Fujian. Was no, but was its own uh, was its own province. It was its own province since 1886. But since but but since but since then they were fighting. That, that but then they were fighting. It took about a year. Actually, the whole thing was put down in uh, 1916, and and for the 20 years, like you know, 10,000 Japanese soldiers died. Uh, uh, you know, to make sure that Taiwan was at its peace, what was at peace. And then the Japanese held on to Taiwan until 1945, so until until the end of the uh, Second World War. So with this, and it was taken over by the nationalists. And it was, it was the nationalists took over, and then so when the when the communists in, uh, uh, were fighting, that they, they, they fled to um, they, they fled in 1949. And so the aftermath we'll talk about next time because that will need to exact to lead to the. 100-day reform in, uh, in 1898, which is when China wants to build its own modern political system, like a like constitutional monarchy. And the failure of that directly led to the Boxer Rebellion. So we're really on to the, uh, the, the final collapse of the, uh, of the, of the, Qing, of the Qing Dynasty. Thanks.